Today, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce two scholars whose work I have long admired, and what better, I've even been able to put to good use in my own papers and classrooms. For years, Professor Jane Burbank, a specialist in law and ideas in the Russian and Soviet empires, and Professor Fred Cooper, a historian of labor in East and West Africa during the colonial period and during decolonization, used to co-teach a seminar on empires and world history at New York University. And graduate students studying empires of all kinds, all kinds from across New York and beyond New York City would flock to take their course just to hear what um, professors Burbank and Cooper had to say about their respective imperial projects. And there was good reason. Professors Burbank and Cooper are masters of taking those small personal stories, peasants in Imperial Russia, filing petitions in civil court, and dock workers in Mombasa, and using them to examine deceptively simple but fundamental human questions, such as how, do, how did people actually use and uphold the state, and how do we think of ourselves in relation to others? Perhaps they can do this so skillfully because both look far beyond their own discipline of history for inspiration, ideas, and collaborators. Nevertheless, I venture to say that their most enduring and important collaborative work has been together. Over 10 years ago, Professors Burbank and Cooper published Empires of World History, it begins with the observation that, for much of recorded human history, people across the world lived in empires of various forms and kinds. Imperial subjects, unlike national citizens, were different, and thus empires, often coercively and hierarchically, governed them differently. Empires in world history thus studies how empires ruled different peoples across wide spaces, uh, wide spaces and for long periods of time. In particular, they examine how empires used local intermediaries, adapted the strategies that their predecessors or competitors had used to, imperial, to rule imperial subjects in the past, and learned new ways of governing conflict-ridden, uh, new ways of governing by studying conflict-ridden borderlands. Today, they're here to present another collaborative project, Post-Imperial Possibilities, Eurasia, Eurafrica, Afro-Asia, which examines how people confronting the dissolution of European empires in the 20th century imagined new post-imperial polities. So without any further delay, Professors Burbank and Cooper are here to speak with us today. So to begin, um, Ben and I were hoping you could tell us a little bit about your career paths and intellectual trajectories. I'm particularly interested in how you both have engaged with disciplines outside of history, you know, which ones have you found productive and why, uh, and kind of doing collaborative work. Um, as you know, you are both um, both authors, both of you have co-authored a numerous uh, articles together. And this is not, um, let's say, as much the standard in history as it is in other disciplines. So I'm hoping you could tell me a little bit about what you've learned from working with other scholars and together. Well, let me begin by saying that this, the story starts with the nature of the liberal arts programs in American universities. Uh, I actually started university it's at Stanford as a physics major. Uh, <laughs> And my conversion to history and to studying Africa was more or less simultaneous. And we're talking about the 1960s when questions of third world politics were very much uh, before people. So as an undergraduate, I studied not only history, but anthropology and political science. Mm -hmm. uh, so my interest in, in, these, uh, in these fields uh, and in looking across different perspectives on them dates to a very early phase of education. I think very important uh, aspect of uh, education is to, to start being really serious about disciplinary perspectives when you have more than one in, in, mm -hmm. in front of you. Uh, so in that, in, that, in that sense, you could, you could see the, the origins of, of the kinds of interdisciplinary work that, I've, that I, as well as Jane, have done uh, quite early uh, in, our, our, in our careers. Uh, since then and since becoming, uh, and since getting my feet very much wet in the details of particular places and particular kinds of historiographies, uh, which is I think also essential for a career path, uh, I was open to, to, to collaborating with other uh, scholars and not just Jane who's in my own uh, field of history, but in a very different part of the world, in a very different part of the world. Uh, but I wrote an article with a sociologist, Rogers Brubaker, and did a series of projects with the anthropologist Ann Laura Stoller. Uh, and 
all of that is 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 part of uh, I I think w the way in which one can engage across conventional lines, both of space and of discipline. Uh, but it starts early. Hmm. It started early with me as well, because I started out at Reed College with a major in Russian literature. And that was the step that got me on the path uh, toward Russian history. But it was not a direct path at all. And uh, I had many um, 60s style um, detours. But uh, when I decided to uh, return to academe, I studied, I took a master's degree. And here again, I think uh, master's programs in area studies were really important. Uh, in this was for me in the uh, 1970s. So my area studies program was a master's degree in Soviet studies uh, at Harvard University. And there we were required to study in different disciplines. So literature, economics, um, political science, uh, these were all part of my formation as a master's student. And it was there in the area studies program that I discovered history. So I made my transit from literature to history between my undergraduate degree and, and this uh, master's program. When I took my first uh, history seminar uh, in the master's program, I really, I discovered what I loved, which was reading texts written by or about real people <laughs> and that I could apply all the tools I had learned as a literary scholar to, to questions about history. So uh, later, um, I also, like Fred, uh, collaborated with other scholars. Um, I had a couple of projects with other scholars of Russian history. Uh, David Ransel and I edited a book on Russian Empire, and uh, I edited another one and worked intensively um, with Mark von Hagen mm -hmm. from Columbia University. And uh, both these scholars worked on different aspects of Russian history uh, than I did. So that was very productive. And then uh, since in the 21st century, uh, I became, when I moved to New York University from University of Michigan, I became a colleague of Lauren Benton. And since that time, uh, Lori and I have worked on a number of projects together and written a number of articles together. So you ask what we learned from, uh, from this experience with others. Uh, I think it's really, uh, a, we learn a lot about the differences, particularly I would say, uh, working with Laurie on international law, the importance of not assuming uh, a single universalistic perspective uh, on the questions that you ask and, and on the answers that you find. Mm -hmm. Let me add one institutional point to that. Both of us were involved when we were at the University of Michigan, where we taught for many years. We were involved in the, in the joint PhD program in history and anthropology. Mm -hmm. There's a quite unusual program to have, to have an actual PhD in two fields at, at, at once. Uh, and it would be really good if, if more institutions did this kind of thing. Yeah. NYU has, has joined programs with history and different area studies. There's a Middle Eastern uh, program that's, that's, that's joined. There's one in French studies, and there are, there are others that, that, that NYU has. These kinds of things, I think, are, are, are very positive institutional uh, contributions. Yeah. I'll, I'll add to that as well, because I directed the Center for Russia, what was then called Russian and East European studies at the University of Michigan at a very exciting time uh, in the early 1990s. And uh, again, we had programs with that area studies program, master's degrees uh, that were joined with journalism, with environmental studies. Um, and uh, these, uh, these, these were, and with art history. <laughs> so these were very formative for the students, but also for me because uh, I got to advise students who were in anthropology, who were uh, in, in art history. And some of those students who are now professors other places have become uh, my closest colleagues. Well, that's great. Thank you very much for that. Um, 
So uh, you note in, to, in the acknowledgments of your new book, which recently came out a few months ago, Post Imperial Possibilities, that the idea of writing something that drew together um, uh, Eurasia, Euro Africa, and Afro Asia um, kind of came out of a talk that you gave at the EUI in 2014. Um, and I was wondering if you could say a bit about how um, this project has changed for you over the past 10 years. <laughs> Well, I, we, we'd like to go further back. Okay. Please. Yeah, <laughs> because uh, both Fred and I were working on projects about uh, colonialism or empire and or empire uh, since well before, <laughs> since well before the, the first book, um, it's from indeed from the 1990s. And um, I think I, I, I'll begin, with, well, both of us pu published books in the mid 1990s that had to do with um, empire. So the book I mentioned with David Ransell on Russian Empire came out in 1996. Uh, Fred mentioned his book, Tensions of Empire, very well known. It came out in 1997. But those were relatively novel uh, uh, beginnings to work on, on, to working on empire for others. And I go back a bit in time to say that in 1990, when I submitted an article to the Russian Review, which was entitled, the imperial construction of Russian nationality. I still stand by this <laughs> title and this principle. It was rejected outright. <laughs> Nobody was interested, it seemed, in this uh, approach to Russian history. Now, by the after, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, there was uh, obviously an increased interest. So we've been working on uh, these topics since uh, well before our, our book came out. Fred, maybe you want to take up the problem from there. <laughs> well, let me uh, take Ben's specific question about the, how much respect has changed since, since uh, 2014. In a, in a way, our, our 2014 talk at the EUI was, was a, a juxtaposition. Uh, Jane had been work had actually done work on, on Eurasianism in in the Russian case in the 1920s in her first uh, book, which was published in the in the 1980s. And for me, the the Euro Africa came up uh, as a uh, through reading uh, the texts from the 1940s and 1950s, when uh, a bit to my surprise, uh, people like Leopold Songor were very much engaged in looking at. Uh, the future possibilities from a year African perspective, rather than a straight opposition between Africa uh, and Europe. So we gave this this the talk at the EU, EUI uh, about each of our uh, pe uh, people, the, the intellectual movements, uh, side by side. Uh, but over time, uh, we started to see the, the connections more closely. Uh, and then another step in this process was was when we. Uh, we, we gave what we thought was going to be a, a, a talk that was kind of a juxtaposition talk. We gave it at the, at the University of Torino mm -hmm. uh, in uh, 2019, just before the, the pandemic. Uh, and people there uh, questioned the, what we were leaving out with these two perspectives that began with a year. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, our response to that, which took a couple of years to work out, uh, was that we had to do it. We had to complete the triangle with Afroasia, uh, and that be, so that became part of the uh, the book. It was really out of out of discussion uh, of our earlier projects that I think we we got more engaged with seeing what are uh, with widening the range of uh, of possibilities that we were that we were encountering, and I think it. Since all three of the uh, elements uh, uh, in our book have have a critique of European imperialism, uh, here we here we we, we had uh, three direct addresses to how to transform that kind of uh, of structure. So I think the the working out of, of of the of the project that added to its to its complexity, and that's why I think there is a difference between the way we were thinking. In our presentation in in uh, in 2014, and the kind of uh, of project that we talked about yesterday in our in our uh, uh, Max Weber lecture to the EUI. Um, one thing I should add, though, of course, um, since our first joint book came out in 2010, 
Uh, you asked about how things have changed in the field, so to speak. And of course, it's just an enormous explosion of, of interest in empire. And it um, so amuses us to see uh, that at every conference program and every field, it seems of social uh, and the social sciences and the humanities uh, that focus on empire is very much, you know, in, in the wind for the last 10 years. And um, uh, our response to that is partly that uh, we don't want to be thinking just about a field of imperial history. We really like to think about writing as historians for others uh, who may take up other topics and we don't want to be encased in, in the idea of empire studies. Mm. Um, yes. I uh, think that's a really great answer to um, our question. So I wanted to ask then, how has um, studying Eurasia, Eurafra, uh, Eurafrica and Afro-Asia together uh, surprised you uh, or changed the way you've been kind of thinking about, um, we don't say empire studies, kind of, let's say, geopol geopolitics or mm -hmm. different ways in which people have organized communities, political communities. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd never heard of your Africa before I started doing uh, research on uh, the, on the questions of citizenship in, mm -hmm. in France and French Africa. Uh, and in, re in reading what African uh, political activists were, say were saying, that was, a, that was in, a, in effect an archival discovery. Uh, beginning in the, in the 1990s, be, there, there started to be literature, particularly in, in, in mainly in French, almost entirely in French at that time. Uh, where people were look, looking at it uh, seriously. So in that in that sense, the the, con the conventions from really the, the the period of decolonization itself, 1950s, 1960s, uh, until near, nearly a half century later, was to to see Africa and Europe as very separate from each other, and the politics of decolonization was was about a, a, rig a rigid colonialism, rigidly oppressive, and a uh, uh, an Africa that was that was not that was in trying to unite in itself or within different uh, categories uh, against it. Uh, and what uh, I learned in, in archival research is that it was much more complicated than that. That both of both of those perspectives had a lot of truth to to them, but there were other ones that were uh, were possible. And your your Africa was a was a way of thinking differently that that. Uh, that was a, that was uh, I think something that I had to learn about, and that a lot of people to whom I talk about in this project are quite resistant to mm -hmm. that kind of perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, as I was mentioned earlier, I wrote about Eurasia in my thesis, <laughs> in my dissertation, and uh, I think it's worth. Uh, mentioning that um, I wasn't even intending to include this kind of perspective on the Russian Revolution in my first, my, my dissertation in my first book. Um, my dissertation uh, uh, was initially, I thought I should just write um, something I was very interested in, which was the non-Bolshevik left. Mm. So the whole dissertation was going to be on Mensheviks, anarchists, uh, and uh, soft liberals and what they thought of the Russian Revolution between 1917 and 1922. I was trying to avoid St the Stalin-Lenin-Stalin -Lenin -Stalin debate and just cut this off and be about the first five years. Um, but I have to uh, give credit to my thesis advisor, who was quite a hands-off minimalist type of advisor. You may be surprised, Richard Pipes. But when I proposed this topic, he said, well, you know, it would be much more interesting if you went all the way through to the right. <laughs> And uh, he was right about that. And as I worked on culturalist explanations of the Russian Revolution or responses, I discovered the Eurasianists. And as I worked on them, I discovered on these, these Eurasianists from the early 1920s were indeed very interesting and pr probably the, the most original uh, of the uh, responders, intellectual responders, I could say, mm -hmm. to, to Bolshevism. So uh, I wrote about them then, and then 
as we were writing uh, this book, um, Eurasianism came back and I had to do more, much more research on the Eurasianist comeback. Uh, I knew it existed. <laughs> I read Marlene Laruelle's terrific works. Um, but as I dug more into it, I was shocked but to discover how much had been published um, in the 21st century on the Eurasianists, that these works from uh, the 1920s had been rediscovered and were being published for a Russian public. Uh, the letters of Savitsky are available. Savitsky's poetry is available, this sort of thing. So that was a surprise. But the, um, the question is partly about how thinking about these three projects together um, changed our way of thinking. I can't exactly say change, but uh, what I was fascinated by was um, the very different valences of these three projects and that the Russian one was so culturalist and so unconcerned um, with the specifics of institutions. Mm. Whereas uh, in contrast to Sangor, uh, who makes very explicit uh, the ways that institutions will interlace and interact and where citizenship will be defined, these sorts of things. It's the complete absence of those questions mm. um, in, in a Eurasianism that really struck me as we were working on the project. Mm. Mm. Interesting, thank you. Um, so I guess I'd like to bring the discussion around to the questions of sovereignty. Um, as the categories of empire and nation state have become blurrier over the past three decades, many scholars have turned to the, the concept of sovereignty as an approach to studying statehood or empire. And I guess I was wondering if you could say a bit about when and how you found um, the framework of sovereignty useful in, in your work or approach to history. Well, I can, I can say a few things about uh, that. And I think it actually follows from what Jane just said uh, in response to the previous uh, question. Uh, if you look at the after empire question or how to get rid of empire question, uh, one obvious answer is you it, it is this is a problem of sovereignty and the answer to it and the answer to it is you completely separate the sovereignties of the ex-colonial power from the ex-colonized uh, power and that the the uh, answer to uh, to uh, to the exploitative nature of, of, of empire what was a separation of, of sovereignties. Uh, Sangor's thinking about this, and it was, which was central to African approaches to your Africa, was quite, was quite more uh, complex than that. Uh, and he saw two, two things. One, that, that uh, if, you, if you are going to decolonize into s distinct nation states, you are creating a lot of, uh, you're proliferating states, all of which are small, and in most in African states are relatively low population, uh, with a couple of exceptions, uh, and, and almost all poor. Uh, if you see, if your perspective is purely African, uh, you can start to think about African unity, but maybe this is just going to be unity and poverty. So Sangor's uh, argument was you had to think about sovereignty in much more complex ways, and indeed in ways growing out of empire and transforming it. That is that 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 uh, that imperial sovereignty was often a layered sovereignty in which not which acknowledged subunits within it, which were ideally from the empire emperor's point of view kept separate from each other, but had a relationship to the imperial center. That is vertical relationships. Sangor's retake of this is you had to combine vertical relationships with horizontal relationships, but without extinguishing the vertical. And his idea was that if you could get African territories to cooperate with each other, then you could you could have a collectivity that's strong enough to put pressure on, on Europe uh, to, to redistribute resources. And what he was hoping for is to have institutions capable of exercising forms of sovereignty at the territorial level, at the level of Africa as a whole, at least French, at least French speaking Africa, 
uh, and the connection to to France, which would be more confederal than 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 federal, recognizing the nationality of each component part, an African nationality. Senghor in the 1950s was thinking much more of an African nationality than a Senegalese nationality. Uh, but all as this is saying, this the thinking behind your Africa is about visions of sovereignty that are not uh, all or nothing, that are taking into account different layers and are trying to use institutional configurations at each level against the other ones in order to try to bring about a transformation of a socioeconomic uh, situation that was one of extreme uh, inequality and exploitation. Uh, so thinking about, about uh, sovereignty in these kinds of, of ways was essential to, to, to the Euro-African perspective uh, on how to bring about a economic and social transformation uh, of the world, which takes a, the realistic view that what we're starting from is extreme inequality, and how do you do something about it? Well, for the for me, the beginning of um, thinking about sovereignty in these in, in these contexts uh, really uh, makes me want to. Uh, to emphasize the fact that there's no one such thing as sovereignty. And uh, I've been um, fighting this battle a lot in my work on law, um, particularly in some European contexts, where there's a deep commitment to sovereignty, meaning a certain set of political practices, uh, popular sovereignty, democracy, rights, civil rights, and so on. And um, my uh, battle, not my defense, but my battle has been to say that there are other ideas of sovereignty in the world and people both uh, believe in different notions of sovereignty and rulers practice different notions of sovereignty. So um, to take uh, the Eurasianist uh, perspective and to contrast it with uh, Sangor, uh, Trubetskoy did have um, an idea of how um, a great state should be governed. And uh, he modeled this on what he imagined to be, and in some cases was correct about um, the practices of the Mongol Empire. Mm -hmm. um, and he very explicitly in his book with the fabulous title, The Legacy of Genghis Khan, published in the 1920s, um, he spelled out what Russian sovereignty should be and how it should work. And this was to have a, an emperor at the top um, who would be advised by a circle of uh, uh, elites. Um, and each of them would be tied personally to the em em emperor, but also represent people at what he called the bottom story of the building. Now, the bottom of the story of the building had many different rooms. And in those rooms, people could practice their own religions, their own customs, their ways of life. But their, uh, these uh, intellectuals who could see the advantages of what he called a refined culture at the top would join the council of advisors around the emperor, the czar, and give him advice and come up with ideas that would be acceptable to all the people in the bottom story of the building. So it's essentially a um, culturalist idea of sovereignty. That is, there should be ideas, there should be concepts, there should be beliefs that are both available, made available to and shared by people across a huge space, but people with different ideas. So this, is a notion of sovereignty, which is um, in some ways ha has some sense of institutions. That is the advisors of the, the carriers of sovereignty around are these elite advisors around the czar. Mm -hmm. um, but it also, uh, I think it's very important when we start to think about sovereignty is to think, what do people believe in? Not just these elites, not the Sangors and the Trubitskoys, but people on the ground. Um, where are their notions? What are they about? And so uh, my suggestion is that across a huge part of the globe, many people believe in a sovereign and are 
thinking about that sovereign in a way that is not much connected to democracy, civil rights, equality. They may be thinking about a claim for protection on the part of this sovereign, uh, that the sovereign should be protecting my sphere um, and, and my way of being. But um, it's not necessarily the case that people around the world believe in a universalized European notion of equal rights mm -hmm. and that that is the essence of the state. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to follow up a little bit about that and ask you about the kinds of economic communities the people you have studied have imagined and kind of how they thought they were engaged, they could engage with or dismantle, be it kind of 1920s hegemony of the gold standard and free trade or kind of, you know, present day IMF kind of politics. Um, I was curious about that. Well, the Euro-Africanists were... were chronologically in between there, uh, and they were reacting to a, uh, a, a, a kind of Euro-Africanism that came from the Europe and from a very reactionary uh, view, even within European politics, that Africa was there simply to be exploited, and Euro-Africa would, would meant cooperation and exploitation rather than rivalry and exploitation. Uh, the the African version of, of Euro Africa was to turn that upside down and, and to say that, that Europe's claim on Africa could become Africa's claim on Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you, I think there are, there are, there are different visions with, within uh, that, all of which uh, are directly opposed to colonial capitalism, mm -hmm. with a lot of ambiguity about capitalism with different adjectives in, 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 in front of it. Certainly in the 40s and 50s, nobody was, nobody was talking about. Uh, about uh, the liberal free trade version of capitalism. Mm -hmm. That was that was not the politics uh, of it. Sangor's uh, vision was, was something he kept referring to as African socialism, which was, which was not a Marxist uh, socialism, not at all modeled on the on the Soviet Union or on on uh, communist China, uh, but one in but one in 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 which market structures would have to be uh, articulated with community. In one sense or another, and, and Sangor was thinking of community at different levels. It could be from the vil the village or the small community. He liked the phrase la petite patrie, patrie uh, up until the, the, the very large scale uh, of uh, Euro Africa, in which he he saw that a political relationship in which in which Africans would would be part of uh, Euro African institutions uh, would be able to pose a counter to a purely exploitative relationship between uh, the continents. So it's very, very much a, uh, a, uh, a vision uh, of economy uh, that, uh, that takes as a, as a starting point that there are different uh, elements with, within it that have to be seen in relationship to uh, each other. And you're not gonna go to a, a communitarian vision that's simply uh, enlarged in scale to the to, to Africa or to the world, uh, you're not going to have a pure market vision in which in which every individual component is relating to e to each other through some kind of market mechanism. You're going to have you're going to have to think about what these relationships actually are. So in that's in in uh, in that sense, uh, you you are dealing with it with a, with a, with a direct address to the kinds of issues you're you're, you're talking about but Sang Sangor was much less explicit about what the economic uh uh actions that should be taken uh would would be than he was about the institutionalization of politics mm -hmm. uh and that I think was a real problem in 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 what happened after uh afterwards because Sangor did not get the kind of institutional structure of politics that he was he was seeking and he ended up as the president of Senegal not as a political actor among other political actors in some kind of Euro African institutions so he was he, the the question is what what could he do with the the unity actually had and the and the the answer is not particular it's not particularly pretty and not particularly edifying uh he he became trapped in his in, in he be, he became part of the the trap that he had uh, envision would 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 occur with the, the kind of national model of uh, of decolonization, 
Uh, he ended up being an author authoritarian too, and with, with uh, never solved the, the problem of, of the exploitative nature of French Senegalese economic uh, mm -hmm. relations, or for that matter, exploitative relations within Senegal, which is not which was within itself not an egalitarian uh, uh, politics. Uh, so you know they, these are these are uh, are fundamental questions, and I think the Euro African way of thinking about it uh, was uh, a way uh, was in, in many ways creative. And it's and the the fact that you did not end up with any kind of uh, multi-layered uh, politics, but rather a separation of of politics at different uh, levels, had had consequences, mostly negative consequences, uh, for the possibilities of a post-imperial future for for countries like Senegal. Well, I'll speak uh, for three different Eurasianists on the question of the economy. I mean, it might be surprising to, to you to think that these emigres in the 1920s were really not that concerned with um, communism, socialism on the part of the Bolsheviks. Um, that Trubetskoy's objection, uh, his, his major enemy was European imperialism. And he did not like the Bolsheviks, uh, but he thought that their socialism was a borrowed European concept and that it eventually would change so that he, he just didn't take this all that seriously. Um, he, what he liked about Bolshevism um, was that it made the Europeans afraid. So he, he, he felt that this, he, <laughs> to the extent that it was part of a, a discussion, he felt that, that the, um, possibility of Bolsheviks uh, uniting people of um, who had been um, colonized uh, against the Europeans, uh, this was positive. Um, of course, he thought that their, uh, their atheism was anathema because to him, his atheism was a was a denial of um, what he saw as a great possibility of the Eurasian sphere, that is to have multiple religions. But he did like the fact that the Bolsheviks made the Europeans squirm. Now, on the other hand, Savitsky is a very interesting thinker about economy, not so much about the questions of um, who controls the means of production, uh, but rather about a spatial environmentalist approach to economic uh, organization and possibilities. So he had this notion of place development, which meant that economic and social possibilities should arise from a particular environmental location. Mm -hmm. And that led him to theorize Eurasia as a great autarkic space, continental space, which had resources corresponding in many ways to those of the maritime empires, but had this great diversity of resources and had means of connect connecting them um, by ground transit, by rivers, by the new railroads, and so on. Um, and that was what could empower uh, Eurasian, uh, Eurasia as a great economic and social and political space. It's a very different mm -hmm. idea, but he did not address specifically capitalism or, mm -hmm. or, uh, or socialism. And if we leap way ahead uh, to the Eurasianism of the 1990s and the, and the 21st century, you will see a real absence of discussion of economic Mm -hmm. uh, economic positions on the part of someone like Dugan. Mm -hmm. um, uh, after all, the um, young communists who wanted to uh, transform the Soviet Union into an authoritarian space, a la Jean Kirkpatrick, they did succeed, mm -hmm. these people in power, and they did succeed in creating a new statist um, uh, capitalist environment. Um, but he doesn't really touch upon that much. Um, communism is condemned uh, by Putin explicitly, 
um, for its national policies, its nationalist policies as being a great mistake. Um, but uh, there's, there's, there's a very little discussion mm. of the economic uh, question at all by today's new Eurasianists. Mm. As for most um, political discussions in Russia, it's about power and not about economics. Well, that means that leads into circling back to thinking about the Afro-Asian perspective on the question mm -hmm. you you raise, which is in some ways uh, an attempt at, at creating horizontal solidarity on a global scale uh, among all the ex-colonial states of Africa and Asia, and possibly in some cases one could include Latin America, uh, but without a political institutional basis for it. For the by the although the there, there were Afro-Asian movements in the pre-World War II period that were, in effect, movements of, of uh, people, some of the strong cultural element uh, to it. And with, with the revival of, uh, with the new version uh, of, uh, of Afro-Asia epitomized by the Bandung Conference of 1955, uh, the, the movement basically accepted that the uh, ex-colonial world would be divided into, into national states. Uh, and did not have particularly clear ideas about how you could build an institutional structure above that level uh, that would challenge global capitalism or, for that matter, global communism. Uh, and you, you, in, in a way, what you see is, an, is repeated attempts to deal with the economic issue as an economic issue, the uh, most explicit being the, the call for a new international economic order uh, that was very much on the agenda in the 1970s and even got a UN General Assembly resolution in its favor in, 19, in 1974. Uh, but the backing for the uh, NIEO uh, came from very diverse uh, national states uh, running the gamut from democratic to authoritarian and, and, uh, and uh, from right wing to left wing. Uh, and did not have concrete proposals uh, for how you would institutionalize a, a, a transformation of, of, uh, of uh, institutions that were capable of enforcing a, a, a transformation. They certainly had ideas about what a new economic order would, would look like, but not how you would get there. And it met the opposition not of the first world, which did not want to redistribute its own resources, and of the second world, which had a, uh, its own vision of a communist world order that was not that of, of the NIEO. Uh, and in, in, that, in that sense, you're, 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 you're seeing uh, an, uh, an ideas about that economic order should be transformed, but not, all, not very clear about how you, you get there. I think in some ways that's where we are now. Uh, and, th and that there are repeated efforts uh, in, in terms of uh, notions of combating world poverty, uh, dealing on a world level with a, with a climate uh, crisis. Uh, uh, certainly the issue, the issue of global uh, inequality is, is, is on, is on the, the agenda. Uh, what we don't see is, is, are uh, people coming up with, with, uh, with uh, realizable possibilities for creating political institutions that could actually transform uh, the, the international economic order uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that would, would, under, would undermine uh, the kind of, uh, of global capitalism as it exists today. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could say a bit about what you see as the some of the futures of research in the, um, in the field. I, I guess I would say in the field of imperial history, but perhaps we don't wanna, um, in the spirit of your work, confine ourselves to empires or nation states where the future of the field. Um, just. <laughs> I like to think of the future as very open-ended for research projects. And um, uh, so much work has been done in uh, the, uh, field of empire studies in the last uh, 15 years, and I expect to see more being done. Um, well, what I'd like to see is people be able to escape from any kind of uh, faddish-ism <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and instead um, ask interesting questions uh, about how societies interact and, and with each other and how they work. Uh, not necessarily tying them to the questions of uh, colonialism or empire. And in fact, um, 
the kind of knee jerk um, use of the rhetoric of decolonization, I think can get in the way of helping people frame um, their inquiries. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going to find um, repression, you'll find it. Um, if you you want to find um, colonial um, agents uh, with with pernicious motives, you'll find them. But um, more interesting is actually to try to figure out, it seems to me, as historians, how societies worked or dysfunctioned uh, in the past in, in a very open-ended way. So we find ourselves um, struck by the creativity of people's uh, younger scholars' projects today and um, their mo move away from these very bifurcated um, uh, kinds of terminologies and, and questions. Yeah, I think you're the people to answer the question. <laughs> not in the, not in this spot, but in the in, in the kinds of work that you you and other people in your generation are are uh, are doing. Uh, and we would we would hope that people won't become uh, obsessed with notions of of terms like the imperial turn, as if everybody's supposed to turn at the same time, and and anybody else who who doesn't is making a uh, is going down a one way street. Uh, so we would we 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 apply this to, to, even to the fields that we've been in, like working on uh, uh, on uh, an empire. I think this is this is true uh, about ideas of a global turn and we, we, the nature of which uh, is is far from clear to what that would actually mean is far from clear uh, to me. Uh, so I I I. I agree with Jane that I that I think it's it's uh, the, what what the future future that I would hope to see in scholarship is is for is for people uh, looking bringing new perspectives, not jumping on bandwagons, and 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 seeing uh, different ways of looking looking at at, at connectivity without presume with and, and taking a relational approach. Uh, uh, I think one can uh, scholarship has tended uh, to a certain degree to to try to think in categories, so you 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 have people who 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 are are uh, being defined by some kind of identitarian category or some kind of class category, some kind of geographical category, and you're assuming that that's that these are the actors, the, these are the relevant units of of history. We we don't we wouldn't deny the importance of of thinking categorically. We have to use categories, otherwise you're not being able to communicate anything to anybody else. Uh, but we want to think about categories relationally in, in, in terms of, of, of how people uh, who are, are, are trying to move uh, and change the, the, the way different aspects of their lives uh, bring about different kinds of networks, different kinds of collectivities, different kinds of, of, uh, of uh, epistemes. Uh, and I think by opening up the range of possibilities that one uh, that one considers about about relationships, I think one can uh, push further in in, uh, in ways that uh, I don't think our generation of scholars uh, has done a good enough job. Mm -hmm. So, if I might take the opportunity to ask, I'd say probably the last question of this interview, but um, and you you've already kind of begun answering it. So, I guess my question is, what advice would you give? to younger scholars or scholars starting out today. Um, I think when I wrote this question, I had just read uh, Professor Burbank uh, talking a little bit, or she had a short article talking about working uh, in Russia during the collapse of the Soviet Union and kind of what that meant for both doing work in the US and doing work in Russia. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about kind of, mm, you know, we work very often on challenging mm. questions in places where, you know, um, Challenging research conditions. Yeah, and so what kinds of advice do you have to scholars who are are confronting young scholars, particularly who want to do innovative work, but don't necessarily find themselves in situations that are very often conducive to it? Mm. Well, first, let me just follow up more generally um, on what Fred was saying, and that is my real advice to young young scholars today. Um, is you know not to be afraid of uh, persisting in in your inquiries, even if it seems to be um, not you know uh, not in accord with what your elders are, are doing. And um, one thing to remember 
And one thing to remember perhaps is our book in world on empires and world history, which um, has now been translated into 11 languages and so on, was never even reviewed in the American Historical Review. <laughs> <laughs> and when it was reviewed, when it first came out in the TLS, it was completely dissed and <laughs> completely ravaged by the reviewer. So, um, you know, don't, don't, my advice is, you know, don't stick to <laughs> what people have already defined as, as the field or the approach or the answers and instead to pursue your own, your inquiry. Now, on the question of doing research in difficult conditions, right now, you could say that it's a ah, very depressing time for people who work on any, any part of, um, Russian history, I mean, Imperial Russian history and Muscovite history, let alone the Soviet Union and um, 20th century history. Um, we, as Russian historians, had a golden age of archival access, and it started in 1991, and it started to close down in 2008. And so there's actually a generation of scholars who were doing their PhDs in this period who had suddenly enormously more archival access um, than their elders had had. And now we have another generation of people with who are building on um, this really very dynamic field, uh, but can't go to the archives and, and probably won't be able to go for a very long time. So what is my advice? Well, first of all, um, even though I um, have a, a reaction negative reaction to sort of the overall notion of decolonization or decolonized Russian history. After all, I've been working on Russian empire since the 1990s, and I, there are many specialists who have been doing so. So it's not new to be studying Russian empire. De facto, in some ways, um, the field is getting decolonized in the sense that one can go work on in the archives of some of the other descendant states of the Soviet Union and not the Russian Federation. There was already a very lively field of Central Asian studies. Um, and now even more people are looking, working in Kyrgyzstan and, and Kazakhstan uh, using their facilities. Not that these are unproblematic, but as all of you know, working in any archive has its particular difficulties, any national setting. So one effect of the changes now and looking ahead for people in this field is that you can go work um, in these formerly uh, Russian or Soviet areas. One of the most promising is Finland. Finland had a national li the National Library of the Imperial Russia and so has enormous resources uh, for work. And the other thing I'd like to say to future scholars in so-called my field or my space um, is that there was a lot of very good history written be during the Soviet period when archival access was extremely limited. But people did, they found the kinds of questions they could work on, in many cases intellectual history, but even in social history, they were able to use these facilities outside of the USSR and to do a great deal of very in interesting work and uh, creative work. So um, it's not impossible to work on a subject um, which would take you to a national setting in which the archival access is either impossible or very limited, but you do have to come up with questions that can be answered and sources that you can find, but this can be done in quite a creative way. Mm -hmm. I think in some ways the moral of the story is do what you can, uh, and that there's and you probably can do a lot more than uh, than you, you might think at first glance, given given the obstacles. And uh, African history uh, defined itself as as a subfield of history in a situation of 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 addressing different difficult source material. Mm -hmm. I, what African history differentiated itself from from French and colonial history or British colonial history by saying we want we want it we want to talk about uh, about Africans we want African perspectives uh but you're dealing with with societies that uh until uh well into the 20th century were majority non-literate 
And so the, the written record, if, if what you're going to do is to, is to go to the French National Archives, the written record was very, was very much a, a colonial perspective on, on things. So right from the start, from the, from the we're, talk, we're talking over a half century ago, uh, African historians were trying to confront a difficult situation and in, in, in obtaining source material about the questions they really wanted to, to ask. But I think the, the, the field was built on, pe on people being creative about how how you you did that, and and a lot of this involved oral sources. Uh, some there've been an innovative work uh, going back centuries using linguistic methods to try to figure out through through the kinds of uh, lexical uh, changes and and and, and wordless changes that 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 people in wordless analyzing wordless in present day languages, trying to reconstruct even a social history of of, of long ago. Uh, I now uh, people confront the difficult the difficulty that uh, the most African states do not have archives that were organized as well as the British or French archives were during the colonial period, and everybody wants to bridge the, the line. We, it's, it's it's not a line; it's a it, it's a fuzzy frontier between between colonial and post colonial history. So I think a lot of people want to uh, to look on both sides of uh, of that and look at transformation in a in a perspective that does not assume. A, uh, a break in all aspects of life with that, but then you're confronted with 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 uh, uh, the problem that the that the, the sources for one side one one period is are better than the or e easier to to obtain and easier to use than from another. Uh, but people are dealing with that. Mm -hmm. uh, people are, are want to deal with history of connectivity, which, which we've mentioned bef uh, before. Uh, that in, often involves research in multiple archives. That's expensive. It often involves research in multiple languages, which take time to, to learn. Uh, so one way of thinking about this that I think is might be useful for young scholars, it's a thing not just in terms of the PhD dissertation you want to write, but in terms of a, of a future career mm -hmm. in which you can do more than one thing at a time. And you, you can do projects uh, that take longer than the few years that the EUI or other institutions allow you. Uh, but if you're thinking, if you're thinking in career terms, well, maybe you you, you will learn another language. Maybe you will have uh, get funding and and find time to go to uh, archives in different in different parts of uh, of the world and uh, address over a period that is in in uh, in decade terms rather than year terms uh, some research projects which are uh, too com too complex. Uh, to, to do in the kinds of time frames that then institutions allow you to do for in, for initial uh, project, but there is a, a a lot of uh, a lot of ways in which one can can look uh, ahead and and see possibilities for what one can do even in situations where there there are there are enormous difficulties in Af in Africa uh, there are whole parts of the continent where it's just not safe to do, to do research and the scholars I know I know quite a few of People who like to work in the in the Sahel, and the, a lot of them are in, in uh, are in despair of the that uh, not only the conditions that people living there are facing, but the the possibility of doing anything to understand what the problems of, that these people are facing are are, are nearly impossible to to do. Uh, but I think over time, people will figure way, ways uh, around that, and 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 uh, and hopefully conditions will will uh, will change and and allow. Uh, uh, field work in places where it would be too dangerous to do it uh, to do it now. Uh, so the the people have to keep their uh, uh, their their focus on what is what they can do at any at any moment and look uh, and look at ways of getting around the obstacles that uh, that arise. And I think in a way that's not a new problem. It's it's something that that uh, that scholars have have always confronted. African his, his historians have confronted them, but particularly strong way in dealing with a discipline that valued the, the archive uh, in a situation where the archive is, is, is very uh, is very monolithic in the kinds of, uh, of perspectives that the written archive had. But people discover there are lots of other archives, lots of other libraries other than the colonial library that can be used. So I think in the, fu in the future there are going to be there are going to be variants on, on these themes uh, and there'll be on, and in the obstacles and the ways in which people can deal with these obstacles. Well, thank you both so much. Uh, do you want to add anything, Ben? I don't believe so. I just, um, it's been a very uh, 
lovely time discussing your work with uh with with you and um yeah uh, we hope to have you back at the eui whenever we're ready to discuss more <laughs> well, thanks very much well thanks for having us here yeah. it's a pleasure. and wonderful questions that you've been asking yeah